I didn't introduce myself. If it's your first time today, we're so glad that you could join us. My name is Paolo. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, so glad you could uh, be with us as we uh, journey through the Ten Commandments. We are on commandment number eight today. So just in case you need to uh, listen to the recent messages or the past messages, they will be at victoryfort.org on podcast. Now, let me uh, just download a few things in terms of, you know, this, this past week, um, it's been a lot of, a lot of uh, activities. We had a recent prayer and fasting. How many of you joined our recent prayer and fasting? Uh, we're continuously believing God uh, that, that our, more than the faith goals, I pray that it's not just the faith goals that we're after, but really our hearts to, be, to lean toward Him, uh, that we would continue to seek Him and encounter Him in a powerful way uh, the rest of the year. So that's the prayer. And so we did that this week. There's a lot of things that happened. Now, before that last weekend, uh, I wasn't here because uh, my son turned, turned 13, my, our third child, and he had this crazy idea. Uh, he said, Dad, I, I want to be able to, you know, maybe we can cycle from Tokyo to the foot of Mount Fuji. And so I said, you want to do that? All right, okay, let's try, okay? And so we did, actually, all right? Uh, we, we cycled from uh, Tokyo to Mount Fuji, the bottom of Mount Fuji, and wherever, uh, it, you know, the day would get us, uh, we'd actually just go ahead and camp, okay? There was, uh, there was a nice one uh, area that there was like a nice river, and so do na kami naglaba, naglat na ligo, everything, uh, shower and uh, wash our clothes, that's it. And so anyway, it's just like an ultimate me and my dad camp for him and me. Um, and, you know, as I said, he turned 13. Uh, some people would call it the mar- bar mitzvah. Uh, for me, I call it bakitva. okay? Why are we... <laughs> Why are we even here, okay? Uh, there were times that we would push up our, our bikes up the hill. Because, you know, from Doshi to Kanagawa and just the, these different hills. We'd go up and down. It was really hard, okay? And so, but we made it through. Um, and then he wanted to push it forward. He said, let's go up the summit of Mount Fuji, right? And so we did. Actually, we went up the summit of Mount Fuji. Um, and uh, one on the left, we're still happy because just this, that's just in the middle of the mountain okay uh the 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 highest is the peak already um and that's when it was you know the winds were 50 kilometers per hour it was really strong and we had to dock and because uh you know we would be blown away by the wind and so again trying to even get that picture was a difficult one uh but you know staying up there and then waiting for the sunrise the next day uh sunrise now i know why it's called the land of the rising sun it, it rises at 4 30 a.m and so uh, this was sunrise 4 30 a.m the next day and so the clouds were beneath us and just the beautiful scene and, and you know you realize wow god did a great job then he do a good job creating the, the universe and the world and so anyway that was uh, our weekend last weekend uh, it was a five-day trip and then we got back tuesday in time for a prayer and fasting now um we want to take a moment to uh, go to uh, chapter or uh what we call this uh, commandment number eight rather uh as we have started uh, eight weeks ago uh, this series entitled 10 perfect law perfect love uh, nothing wrong with the law, nothing wrong with God's love. What's wrong is our hearts. It's our hearts that have rebelled against God. It's our hearts that have disobeyed against God. And so that's why Jesus had to come. Jesus had to save us from our sins. In fact, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. And so that's exactly why Jesus came. Um, and this law, the Ten Commandments, the Ten uh, Instructions, and the Ten uh, 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 laws that God gave that summarizes the whole 613 other laws um, are found in the the book of Exodus. Um, Exodus is a spectacular book. It's something that if you haven't read through from chapter 1 to the end of it, it's something I would recommend you to read. It's just, it's like watching an epic movie. It's really uh, fascinating to read it. It's a story of redemption when God calls the people of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land from a life of slavery into a life of freedom. And so that's, that's basically the story. And now God calls everybody, his people, about two to three million uh, Jews, two to three million Israelites. And what originally was supposed to be a two-week journey from Egypt to the promised land became 40 years. 40 years because of unbelief, 40 years because of lack of faith. And they started up north where Egypt was, 
And from there, they traveled, they got detoured down south towards the wilderness of Sinai. And so now at the wilderness of Sinai, uh, God calls everybody and says, you know, kind of like a, a family meeting. You guys have a family meeting sometimes, right? Before you go into Tita's house, you call your children. Okay, you kiss every Tito and Tita going there, right? You give all these different instructions. Or we're going to a trip. And we're, because we're going to a trip, you need sweaters and jackets and all these. And so that's what God was trying to do. Because you are my people... You are coming out of Egyptian slavery and you've gotten so used to the culture, the lifestyle of the Egyptians. You not just think like Egyptians, you live like the Egyptians. I'm getting you out of that mold and I'm, I'm, I'm forming you to become my own nation. And so this is what was going on. So he calls a family meeting and tells them these are the instructions. Now, God was giving them uh, instructions and, and in verse 2, and I, us, uh, I normally go back to verse 2 and verse 3 because it's very important before we continue on with the different commandments, uh, verse 15, verse 16, and towards the end, we need to always refer back to the first two verses and three verses. Why? Because here we see God introduces who He was or who He is. I am the Lord your God. That's who I am. Not only does he introduce himself, he also reminds them of what he's done for them. I brought you out of the land of slavery. That salvation came first before the law. Okay, this is important. That the salvation and the rescue mission that God made for them came before following the law. And so it, the law was not given so that they could become the children of God. They were the children of God, and that's why they have to live a certain way. You guys get it? He's not saying, I'm going to adopt you as my kids if you obey the Ten Commandments. He says, because you're my kids, because I love you, and because this is good for you, these are the Ten Commandments. You follow? This is very important. Now, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, this is one really short verse. Last week, Pastor Joey talked about uh, you shall not commit adultery. Today, one short verse, you shall not steal. This is uh, what it, uh, is the commandment that we're going to tackle and unpack today. Now, let me start off by asking you a question. How many of you here have lost something? Raise your hand. You've lost an item. Okay, Kind of like our 3 two, one question earlier. Um, I remember years ago when... Um, the building was very new. I don't know, Ms. Cricket, Pastor Emily, if you remember this. This was very new, and uh, we would have our convergences out there. BGC was just raw land. There was not a lot of buildings. Um, and so we would have our convergences in, in some of those empty spaces. Uh, that's when everybody could still fit in a, in a space, right? Uh, um, we've grown so much Metro Manila-wide. But, but then we, we would have our convergences. And so what happened was... Uh, you know, we, were, we, were, we, we had a worship service together. And then uh, on the way out of the convergence, it was an evening, I couldn't find my phone. Apparently, I must have dropped it or uh, maybe in the parking lot or somehow it, was, it wasn't with me. And so I kept calling it. It was just ringing, okay? It was just ringing. And then the next day, I used my wife's phone and called it. And somebody answered, and it was like, it was a tinge of hope for me. Yay, somebody answered. And so I said, uh, hey, you know, this is my phone. That's the one, the phone that you have is mine. Uh, you know, my name is Paolo. Could you, you know, is it okay? You Let's meet together so that you can return my phone. And, you know, he said in Tagalog, he said, uh, let me say in Tagalog first, and I'll translate it in English. He said, uh, sir, sorry, sir, uh, kailangan ko lang po kasi ng pera. Sorry, hindi ko na ho may babalik. Okay, and so the guy said, "Sorry, I can't give it back. I just really need the money. I'm, I'm, I don't, I won't be able to give this back to you again." I said, "What? You know, you even conversed to, with me and, uh, and and tell me that, okay? You even communicated to me that." And so I was upset, okay. But anyway, um, uh, and so that it, you know, when 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 something is taken from you, you feel violated, don't you? And you feel upset. And when something is whether you're robbed or something is uh, taken without permission, uh, that, that you feel violated, you feel upset. And so today, as we talk about this specific story, now, 
uh, commandment because we need to understand in the context of what God is trying to achieve. Remember, I said he called them out of Egypt into the promised land, slavery to freedom. And as slaves, they had no right to property. So they had no, nothing to own. Now, they're coming out of slavery into freedom. The Bible says in Exodus that they came out with plunder. In fact, not just plunder, but with much plunder, the Bible says. In fact, they asked the Egyptians, and they plundered the Egyptians. They asked them for goods, and the Egyptians started thinking, oh, see, you know, they, let me give you all my stuff. And so they were coming out with lots of goods. What what the situation was before it had nothing. Now they had something. Now they had property. Now they actually owned something as free men and women. And so now God is setting some standards and boundaries and he's saying, listen, you shall not steal. What there is right to property, you have now ownership to the possessions that you have. And you know, Obviously, when, when one guy, some people are more prolific at making their uh, possessions increase or wealth increase, right? And so that's going to happen. Some will, uh, you know, be good businessmen and entrepreneurs and will multiply the money or the wealth that they have. Some, not as good, right? And so, you know, the sinful and the wicked heart will start to, you know, become lustful after more money or greed or, or for whatever reason, then this can actually happen. People will try to get and steal. And so he says, this is a command. Now, let me give you five frequently asked questions. I'll really actually run through this very quickly. FAQs. Okay? Number one, what is stealing? Very simple. The first question is, what is stealing? What is stealing? Well, stealing is taking something that does not belong to you without permission or right, especially in secret or by force. Right? When you have something, when you have a possession, and when that possession is taken from you without permission, secretly or by force, then that's stealing. I remember when my daughter was uh, eight years old, some of you might remember the arcade place that's called Power Station. Anybody here remember that? Okay, now, there's not a lot of arcade stations now. Uh, time Zone is still there, but I don't know if there's still power. I think there's one more in Rockwell, a couple more somewhere else. But so we played in this area, and th this is what the game that we played at that time, Ice Ball or Ski Ball. And so uh, when we got there, uh, on, there were three, kind of like this, there were three slots. On the right slot, there were some tickets that were unclaimed. And so I looked at my daughter. I said, Janina, look, all right, free tickets. <laughs> I said, we can add these to the existing ones that we have, and we'll get a bigger prize. And so she looks at me with a confused face, distraught in some sort, and she said, Dan, if you get something that's not yours, isn't that stealing? <laughs> I said... Yeah, I'm just testing you. <laughs> Here's the pastor trying to ask this daughter to get something that's not his. Okay, and so I had to repent. Okay, and then so, and so if you think about it, it's like it's it's really just because of mindsets growing up, isn't it? Right for me, my mindset was finders keepers. That's right. See, you know, okay? And so and that's what was my mindset. And so good thing, she, that's not her mindset growing up, okay? And so she said, whatever is not yours, don't get it, all right? So if you get something that is not your, of, of your own possession, then, then the Bible says that's stealing. Number two, what does the Bible have to say about possessions and stealing and ownership? Well, number one, the Bible teaches about right to private, private property, there is. You know, the Bible says in, in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the world in it, uh, uh, the world and everything, everyone who live in it. In other words, God owns everything. He owns uh, 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 the cow or the cattle in a thousand hills, right? And so now he owns everything and he has supreme authority to dispense and to distribute Every and each item, good stuff, whatever he wants and wherever and whoever he wants to give it to, okay? 
Not only that, because he's dispensed certain stuff to us, he expects us to become good stewards of it, caretakers and managers. Whatever he gives to us, he, he, he expects us to take care of it, right? And so, uh, not only, the next one is the Bible teaches that God loves you and your neighbor. Now, it is true that God loves us. He wants to provide for us. He wants to bless us. He wants to make us prosper. He, all, he, he, does, he, he wants all that to, be, to happen to us. But sometimes, faith has become so self-centered, we just think about ourselves. God doesn't just love us or me. God loves the person beside me. God loves the person beside you. Look at the person beside you, right? Yeah, that's right. That person on your left, on your right. And so God loves your neighbor too, which means, all right, if I take that is something that is another's, then that is unloving and that is hurting and harming the other. God desires, he says, he says to love your neighbor. Number three, okay, at least in this point right here, the Bible teaches us what we have right not to be stolen from. We have a right not to be stolen from. Okay? If you ask an average guy says, and, and ask him, you know, should anyone ever steal from you? No way! I, nobody should ever steal from me, all right? But if you ask him, uh, what if there's a need and you have to steal? Well, you know, it depends because, you know, it's hard. Life is hard and I might need it and maybe there are reasons for me to steal. It's become a double standard. We are far more committed to our rights rather than our responsibilities. Number three, why do we steal? Um, the Forbes magazine came up with this article a couple years ago, and it is what it said. Whether rich or poor, fe feeling deprived make, makes us steal more. Now, what's it saying? In, in later down the, on the article, it says, but feeling deprived doesn't only affect people on the relative low end of the totem pole, not just the underprivileged or the poor. Alter says that wealthy people can feel financially deprived when comparing themselves to even wealthier peers. Even wealthy people encounter wealthier people. So even long-term financial security doesn't guarantee that you'll never experience transient states of deprivation. What's he saying or what's Alter saying? There's a sense of dissatisfaction that comes in whether you're rich or you're poor. And that's what happens because you begin to compare yourself with another. Whether you're rich or you're poor, even if you're poor, you say, oh, I wish I had something like that. I wish I'm able to purchase that. I wish I can travel and do this and like that. And so whether you're poor or rich, a sense of dissatisfaction sets in. And I love how Pastor Dennis, our pastor in the 2 and the 4 p.m. services, placed it. He said, you know, if, if this were your heart, inside your heart, there are fruits of that sinful nature. And at least in this particular topic that we're in, you know, there's uh, employee theft, there's larceny, tax fraud, intellectual property, you know, downloading music that's not necessarily purchased, uh, embezzlement, and all these things, right? And so there's, there's things that, that, that is in your heart that comes up, okay, because a result of actually lack. What stems from lack, and you don't have this, I want and, you know, I want to be able to watch this movie, and that's why I have to download this movie. Or I need to be able, I want to, I want to have more. And so there's uh, things that we, we do because of, that stems from lack. But, you know, at the roots of this lack is actually dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction. What do I mean? You know, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, okay, they were in the garden. And when, they, when Adam and Eve sinned, Right before they ate the fruit, all right, some people say it's apple, it's not an apple, okay, it's mango, okay, <laughs> I'm kidding, we don't know what it is, but, but somebody, uh, uh, the, the Satan comes and before they ate the fruit, Satan said, if you eat that fruit, you shall be like God, you shall be like God, and that statement is pregnant with lies, it really is, it actually allows insecurity to set in. 
it allows independence to set in. You know what? You know, if, if, okay, I can be like God. So which means if I can be like God, I don't have to be subservient to God. And which is why this morning, some of us, uh, it, it wasn't our natural reaction to connect or to pray to God right away. It's not natural. The very first thing is to connect to Instagram or Snapchat, right? That's the very first thing. Why? Because it's not normal because of the disconnect. Okay? Now, uh, the dissatisfaction has set in because of this lie that Adam and Eve even embraced. And from that on, generation to generation, the original sin was passed on to this day. We're born, the Bible says, with sin in our hearts. And at the root of this, at least for this one, is dissatisfaction. Now, how can this be solved? Okay, you're saying, okay, Pastor Paolo, there's dissatisfaction, and there's just, uh, my, my heart is always desiring for more. What do I do with it? Well, John chapter 10, verse 10. Did you know that the Bible refers to Satan as the thief? He's the ultimate thief, the main thief. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, to destroy. Jesus said, I have come so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. He's saying, you don't have to steal. You don't have to be dissatisfied. Once you have me, you have everything. Once you have me in your life, you will not need anything. Surely I understand the thought of, I still need to eat food. I still need to dress myself, pay tuition. It's almost June, July. I'm sorry, it's July already. July, August, coming in at the new tuition. And so it's like, I do have needs, but... But an understanding that Jesus Christ will bring ultimate satisfaction. And He alone brings ultimate satisfaction. You see, the world will offer different solutions. It will, but it will never suffice. Never be enough. Now, is it wrong to have wealth? By no means. Of course not. God is the one who blesses. God wants us to be blessed so that we can be a blessing. But if wealth becomes the ultimate, that becomes your God. Why? Because the Bible says, remember, and we were going through the Ten Commandments, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. When the good becomes the ultimate, then it becomes your idol. That's what happens. That's what happens to us, to all of us. Money is not intrinsically evil. The Bible says, Paul says, it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. Money's not evil, but it's the love of money that leads to all kinds of evil. See, when the good becomes the ultimate, when something that is even intrinsically neutral, when it becomes your God, then it becomes an idol. Number five, this is the last question. What should we do now? And we'll, we'll camp here a bit longer. What then should we do now? Ephesians chapter 4, Paul speaks to the church in Ephesus. And he tells them, guys, you've been saved by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2, you've been saved by grace through faith. It's not by your own works. It's a gift of God so that no one can boast. Because this is so, then let, no, let the thief no longer steal. But rather let him labor doing honest work and with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. He's saying, because you are now saved, because Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, because you have understood and embraced the gospel of salvation, let no thief uh, steal any longer. But let him labor. Let him labor. He says, work. How many of you know work is a good thing? Raise your hand. Come on now. <laughs> How many of you, work is a good thing? Yeah. Yes, okay, it's a good thing. And I know some of us are, are reluctant to say yes, right? Uh, but tomorrow's Monday, okay? And so, but work is a good thing because did you know that work came before the fall? Work actually came before Adam and Eve fell into sin. Work, God said, you know, you shall, uh, you shall take care of this garden, Work it, that's what the scripture says in chapter 2, work it, take care of it. And then the sin of Adam and Eve came. So work is actually good. It was created by God. And God said, remember, everything that God created in chapter 1, chapter 2 is good. 
He looked at his creation, sat back on day seven, rested, and he said it was very good. So work is a good thing. And it's the design of God for us to gain income. It's God's design. So if, if you are an employer here and somebody works for you, give them what they, what, the pay that, they, that you owe them. Don't circumvent. Give them what you owe them if you're an employer. If you're an employee, give your employer the best that you can give them. The Bible says in Colossians 3.23, work with all your heart. Not, as not working for men, but working for the Lord. Because you will have an inheritance. You will have a reward thereafter. You know, we encourage, there was a, we had, a, we had an admin person before uh, from church. And uh, she was very excited about world missions. And, but, you know, her job was, you know, as an admin person in the building. And so we had to talk to her. I said, because there were, you know, she would, you know, go out on mission trips. And we said, you know what, if you feel called to the mission trip, or missions rather, you go for it, okay? Because, because we want to make sure you're in your lane, number one. Number two, we want to make sure, you know, the person who's supposed to be doing admin work is doing admin work, not in, the, not in the field somewhere. And so whether that's in the church or even outside, okay, we, you, how many of you know your work is part of your witness? Because sometimes we use ministry or our faith to excuse ourselves, hey, Christian naman ako eh. I'm just, I'm reading my Bible while working. No, 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 no. Read your Bible during break time or lunch time, not while you're supposed to be emailing or encoding. Or I'm praying because, you know, I'm praying for the company. No, don't pray during, you know, you can pray under your breath, yes, but don't spend hours and hours do a prayer meeting when you're supposed to be working. You guys follow? Okay. And so we want to be an excellent testimony. So that when a Christian comes into the workplace, I want that guy. Because that guy is excellent. How many of you know we serve an excellent God and he deserves our best? And so whether that's in the workplace or in church, we give him our best. And so he says, let him labor, number two, do honest work. We're to do continuously honest work. Now, employee theft, we talked about that earlier five times now. Can okay, U.S. News tells us through Hayes International Consultants. Um, you know, rep- made a report that the average employee steals five times, 5.5 times more than the average shoplifter. That's huge. And that would cost 200 billion U.S. dollars, okay, uh, of employee theft for, of stocks and supplies, which is a good question to ask, all right? Do we have stuff at home that's supposed to be in the office? It's a good question. From paper clips to bond paper to printer to refrigerator, okay? <laughs> I know, exaggeration yan, okay? Uh, but just, uh, it's a good question. Now, salary.com said it this way. He said, an average, uh, on an average eight-hour work day, 2.09 hours is wasted. And how is it wasted? Okay, through, I'll, I'll explain that later. You know, again, it's like, kind of like you say, it's not a big deal, Pastor Paolo. Well, it's not a big deal, but it's a big deal if you own the company. Switch the position around. If you're the owner of the company, you wouldn't want that. Right? Yesterday, I, I, there was a baby dedication, and my wife and I went to the reception of one of our friends' kids. Um, and so we, it, it's a place called Nacional, it's a South American diner. And they had something like a pastry off the menu, this one right there. It's like, it's, it's just, it, my, 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 my uh, daughter calls it the bomb, okay? It's like just really so good and so it's amazing. Uh, and so when you eat it, it's like oozing out of the, whatever, the sweetness out of, uh, from, from the inside. And, but anyway, just in, in case you, if, if I go there and I buy eight, and then I get home, and I find in the box there's only six. How many of you, you'd be frustrated? Yeah. You would be. And so it's the same way, okay? If, we, if we're expected eight hours and we put in six, there's frustration there. And, and, and time wasters are, number one, 43% of the time wasted is internet. Facebook, 
YouTube, okay, um, social media. And then socializing. Socializing meaning if you're, if you're going um, from room to room or from, you know, you know, you go to another employee, hey, how are you? What are you doing? Nothing. How about you? Nothing. Okay, let's talk. <laughs> and so now you start talking, you're socializing. Oh, what's, you know, what are you going to do Christmas time? Okay. Oh, did you watch this teleserie? Oh, you know, yeah. Wow, 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 crying. And so then you're crying there. Socializing. Or personal business. Six percent of the wasted time go here. We pay our bills online. We email personal stuff. We use our, fix our calendar. We return emails. And you have a side. Some of us have a sideline business, right? You you have Avon, Usana, Uno. You know, it's like you're sending all these text messages to everybody. Okay, did you buy now? Did you need downline and all that? We're wasting other people's money and time. Robert Half, Robert Half Personal Agency said about $70 billion a year. Time theft. Okay. Now, towards the end, he says, we labor, we do honest work. Why? So that we can share. You see, that's, that's the ultimate vision of God for you and for me. So that we can be a blessing to other people. God wants to bless us. But sometimes... You know, you have, we have this container. We just all want to be blessed and blessed and blessed. Okay? We don't want to pour out to another. And how can God pour some more if we're always filled? We want to keep blessing other people as well. Um, work is a blessing. And, and, and God wants us to be a blessing to others. Um, God asks the nation of Israel one time. He said, you're stealing from me. He says. And he talks to the people of Israel. And then the people of Israel were saying, How are we stealing from you, God? How can we even steal from you? Will a mere man rob God? Can I even rob you, Lord? And then God says, Yeah, you rob me. How? In tithes and offerings, he says. Okay? And so he was talking to his people and says, You're taking something that is actually mine. Okay? And some people say, hey, don't talk about my money. Well, okay, that's the fundamental problem because we th you think it's your money. Actually, it's not your money. It's God's money. It's not even my money. It's God's money. And that's why when we give, we don't give. We actually give back. That's, there's a fundamental difference there. If we give, you think it's yours. If we give back, it's actually his. We're just giving back. You follow? There's a big difference there. And that's why stealing is what happens when money becomes our God. Let me explain. Stealing is what happens when money becomes our God. Why? Because my reputation is important. I have to keep up with the Joneses. My image is so important. I cannot downsize. I cannot change or adjust my lifestyle. And that's why I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to cut time here. I need to whatever it takes so that I keep my lifestyle up there. Stealing is what happens when money becomes your God. Whether you're poor or wealthy, it doesn't really matter. It really doesn't. Did you know that poverty and greed are twin brothers? They are. The poor, the uh, poverty says, I don't have enough. Greed says, I don't have enough. Poverty says, I need more. Greed says, I need more. It's the same language right there. But what did Jesus say? You cannot serve both God and money. You can't. You just can't serve both God and money. You know, my, my seven-year-old son, his name is Joaquin, and he... I don't know if you've ever seen those candy. He loves pochi. Have you ever seen pochi? The pink ones. Okay. And so he loves pochi. And every so often, he would uh, nag on me, let's go to 7-Eleven or let's go to um, um, Sari Sari store. I want some pochi. And so, you know, every so often, I'd say, okay, all right, let's go pochi. And so, um, uh, and so we, I bought him, uh, you know, one time, several. And so I said, Joaquin, can I have one? No, this is mine. <laughs> and I said, Joaquin, do you realize? <laughs> Number one, <laughs> it all comes from me. I bought it with my money. That's one. Number two, I have 
the power to be able to buy double, triple the amount that is in your hands. Guys, do you realize that what you have in your hands comes from an amazing God who loves you? That's one. Number two, do you understand that He has power to double, triple that if it's necessary? Because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it, Psalm 24, verse 1. Now, a few verses after that, in verse 22, after the Ten Commandments, listen to what God says. If a man steals ox or sheep, it kills it and sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox, four sheep for a sheep. What's he talking about? This word, restitution. So I'm a restitution. That there's a place for restitution. That if you got something, you pay it back. If you borrowed something, a book, a CD, you know, whatever. You, you have it in your shelf, give it back. Restitution. I remember one of our pastors, before he became a pastor, he worked in an oil company. And you know, you know those uh, oil companies, he was in marketing and in sales, and he had to bring out clients. And there are represent, uh, representation uh, allowances, Right? And so when you have that representation allowance, you can actually, you know, maneuver it kind of. And so he did. And, 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 you know, he would bring out clients, I don't know, McDonald's, but he would give a receipt from Melos or something like that, right? Um, and so, but he, he would just overstate and all that until he became a Christian. And he felt so convicted. And, and he said, I, I need to, so he started computing. He actually paid okay, his boss or his, his company back what he stole. I realized, he said, you know, I had to downsize my lifestyle. I had to make the necessary adjustments. I had to pay. And so I don't know if that would be the same for you. That's his conviction. That's what God spoke to him about. It depends. I don't know how this word of God will land in your situation today, but I'm going to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 11. The Bible says, don't you know that the wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral. Pastor Joey talked about that last week. The idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. Okay? He says, or thieves. He puts it there. He writes it there. Thieves, or the greedy, or the drunkards, or the slanderers, or the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. I like the next verse. If you think of this verse, if you stop here, it's like you're going to feel condemned, right? It's like I was one of these. But you know what he says in verse 11? And that is what some of you were. That is good news. God is able for, for if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. He says, that's no longer who you are. That's the old Paolo. That's the old Lowell. That's the old Georgie. That's the old Joey. That's, this is who you are today. You were justified. You know what justified means? That's such a power. You need to do a word study of that word, uh, justified. It's, it, justification, it's, uh, it's, it's you were guilty. But in God's sight, because of what Christ did, you no longer are guilty. And you are justified just as if you never sinned. In His eyes, it's like just as if you never sinned. That's the condition, the position, how we see, how God sees us now. And that's why, remember in, because all sin is debt unto God. Remember in, in the Lord's Prayer, remember what He said? Forgive us our Sins. Other translation says, forgive us our debts. Sin is debt unto God. Which is why in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 14, the Bible says, You who were dead in your trans trespasses and the uncir uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt. Your sin has been canceled. 
that stood against us with his legal demands, he set it aside, nailing it to the cross. You know what he did? He canceled your debt, but you know what? He didn't just cancel your debt. He gave you an inheritance. Abundant life, John chapter 10, 10 says. Not only don't you have, you no longer have that debt, you were given abundant life, eternal life, you know, all the things that God wants to give you today. An inheritance in Christ Jesus. You are co-heirs with Christ. How many of you know that's an amazing news? That's great news. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand for that. That's the inheritance you and I possess today as we follow him. He said he nailed it to the cross. Nailed it to the cross. And there was no way for us to pay that debt. No way. You can say, you know... Okay, Lord, from now on till the end of my life, I will no longer sin. Can I pay you my debt by that way? From this day until the end of my life, I will no longer sin. Even if you could do that, it's over. You can't. It's all done. Why? Because you already have debt. The Bible says you were conceived in your mother's womb with sin in your heart. And you were born with sin. So you already had pre-existing debt. All you're doing is to stop accruing more debt on top of the pre-existing debt. But Jesus took all your debt on the cross. Not just stealing, adultery, fornication, sexual immorality, lying, cheating, impure thoughts, greed, pride, I mean, some of these sins are external and you look down on them, but some of it is just as bad. Pride, selfishness, greed, lust. It's just as bad. It's just unseen, but just as bad. But Jesus took all that. We owed a debt we couldn't pay. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe. That's how good God is. That's how amazing he is. And you and I today can just enjoy our relationship with him. Can you imagine the great exchange? Who would not want that? Who wouldn't? Amen. Could you bow your heads with me for a moment? I want to pray for two things. Number one, as you bow your heads, I want to pray for not the condemnation of the enemy because there's no more condemnation in Christ Jesus, but really the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Because some of us, you've allowed dissatisfaction to take root to stem into lack and then therefore bear fruit in terms of larceny or fraud or tax evasion or stealing or employee theft or time taken from the company I don't know what that is and again I'm, I'm just trusting the Holy Spirit's work in this room those of you are watching on live stream, to allow the Lord to move. Lord, I pray. I'm not even going to ask a, a raising of hands. But if, if that's you today, just, just pray to God and ask the Lord how you could bring restitution to the situation or even bring a payment back or, or, or somehow fix the situation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. One more thing I want to pray for is this. If, if you're here today and I want to give an, an invitation, maybe you've been to church many years and your parents dragged you to church or, or you've been coming to church or your friends dragged you to church or, or you've been coming because uh, or maybe it's your first time. I 
want to give an invitation. Jesus died and paid and wants to give us a clean slate, a fresh start. If you're here today and you say, as, you, as everybody's head is bowed, if you say, Pastor Paolo, I, I want to give my life to Christ. That's a response to what he's done. He gave his life for me. It's about time I give my life for him. If that's you today, just raise your hand, raise your hand. All across this room. Just lift up your hands. Anybody else? Anybody here? God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Just lift up your hands. God bless you. Praise God. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Praise God. Amen. Anybody else up there? And those of you in the live stream, just follow after me. If, if, you're, if you raised your hand in your heart, mean this prayer. Just ask God to come into your life. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for canceling the debt that I had. It's through your death I can have life. And so Lord, today, as a response to your generous offer and sacrifice, you gave your life for me. I give my life to you. I surrender everything. Help me to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we all stand as we end? You know, Jesus said, uh, let your light shine before men so that you may give glory to the Father in heaven. And so that would be my prayer as we leave today. Lord, I pray as we leave today, I pray that your righteousness, your peace and joy will go with us. I ask, Lord, that, Lord, our life will be a testimony, a witness, that it would be a, a positive witness, that they would see, wow, something is different. Something's amazing. God is amazing. So, Lord, as we leave today, I pray, Father God, that your spirit would empower us to live a life that will honor and please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. 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 amen.